what, what exactly has happened to wealth in Canada in the last 30 years? Um, because we've seen a big change in the way that wealth is distributed and shared over the last 30 years. Maybe you could just spend a couple of minutes, Angela, maybe you could start, and then Jonathan, maybe you could follow up um, with some points to give our audience as we're, we're waiting for some questions to come in, we're starting to get some already, but just a, a bit of a picture of exactly why this issue is so critical right now, because we have reached a level of inequality um, that is kind of unprecedented. Yeah, so people know about, you know, Jeff Bezos and Amazon, how he bought a yacht and he has a yacht for his yacht, right? And Elon Musk and these guys that are spending all of their money trying to get to Mars rather than uh, there's lots of problems on Earth that they could try to solve, uh, but but we tend to think in Canada that this phenomenon isn't happening here, that there aren't um, the same kinds of wealth disparities. And the there's been a lot of work looking at income inequality, but not as much looking at wealth inequality in Canada. And so uh, Credit Suisse um, has done some reports looking at global wealth um, distributions both within countries and between countries and Canada since like 1999 uh, to now the amount of wealth held by the top 1% has more than than doubled and so while the wealth held by the bottom half has only increased by you know five thousand dollars so it's not even so while we've gotten a lot richer as a country over that time period the share so not only have they doubled their wealth, but they've increased their share of total wealth. And so they've increased their share of wealth from about 15% in 1999 to now it's over 26% uh, is a conservative estimate. Some people think it's higher. Um, so the top 1% of Canadians, that's what they own. And so when you start to think about who is this, who are these people, um, there are families that we know of, like the Irvings or the Thompsons or the McCains, um, families that have uh, owned certain companies and gotten wealthy of that. But then there's families that we don't know as much about who have privately held companies um, in, the, in the oil industry or in transportation or, or other sectors. And they have really, um, because of government regulations or because of loopholes or because of um, paying low wages to workers. So the Irvings, for example, are notorious, uh, notoriously uh, anti-union. Um, so union busting. Um, the Irvings also, not to pick on the Irvings, but the Irvings also use um, tax havens a lot. The Westons, uh, Loblaws use tax havens. So there's a lot of tactics that are fully legal uh, that these companies and these families have used in order to accumulate a huge amount of wealth. And it's been a dramatic increase. Uh, and just over the over the course of the pandemic, um, Toby Lucky of Shopify, his wealth has grown dramatically. There's the owner of Lululemon, who's not a very as likable as Toby, um, <laughs> but uh, his wealth has also increased dramatically. Uh, so there are a bunch of um, bunch of uh, wealth holders in Canada who, while everyone else was struggling during the pandemic, they were able to increase their their holdings. And, and we've really seen this phenomena accelerate uh, in, a, in a troubling way. And while the, the current federal government has talked about uh, addressing wealth inequality, it came up in the throne speech, they haven't taken any any action on it to slow it. So Maybe Joe, that's a great place for you to go. What you know, um, in this last twenty years, what has been the government's response to this? You're doubling of wealth over twenty years in the top one percent, which is you know phenomenal and and frustrating. I think for probably everyone listening to hear that. What has what has the government done to either um, exacerbate that or mitigate um, that trend? I mean, like it's it's just not a surprise that we're at where we are. Like it's not, like it's it's just it's not magic. Like we're the outcome that we're facing now are the results of successive decision that governments have made, and it can be liberals, it can be conservative, but from the 
the 90s to today, there has been many, many decisions that led to the situation that we're, that we're in. They, and um, like the Carter Commission uh, raised some solution, they were never implemented. And the fact that capital, capital is not taxed the same way that income lead a lot to what the situation that we're in. Um, the, the riches we have created many, many loopholes or tax loopholes that they can that they can use with the idea that it would trickle down. And we have seen this after many, many reports that the money doesn't trickle down. It's just they 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 keep it and they just enrich themselves and they buy a yacht for their yacht or an helicopter and things like that, which at, at some point doesn't really create economic activity. So it even it doesn't make sense economically to do that because they just keep the money for themselves and it doesn't create economic activity compared to other uh, investment that we could have done that would have helped people to buy things that they really need. Um, so, so yeah, like from Harper to Martin that cut the corporate tax rate by 6% in, in 10 years to um, changing how capital gains are taxed uh, to cutting uh, public services in the 90s or investment in housing. Like there are many, many decisions that have been made that led to the situation that, that we're in. And the current government um, will not, like doesn't have the courage to do what is needed to go back to where we were before the 90s. They will, they might be ready to do things that the richest or the powerful are okay with, like childcare. Like the richest and the powerful want that because they will get women to work and it will be good for their business. Um, but other, when we talk about wealth tax and, and things that the elite and the powerful don't want, they will not have the courage to, to stand up and, and do what is needed to fix our economy. Um, so that's what is challenging and that's what I was saying before, that's why we will need to push uh, politicians to, to act. That's really great. You've already partially answered one of the questions that has come up from our participants. Um, I, I'd love to dig into this a little bit more because there's a lot of, um, a lot of myths that you cover in, in the book. Um, myths such as, you know, rich people and big companies that have all of this profit and wealth are actually the people that we depend on to create jobs in our economy. Um, and oftentimes that's been used as a rationale as to why we can't raise any sort of taxes anywhere at any time. Um, and, and there's been a lot of evidence that's proved that wrong. Uh, maybe starting with you, Joe, you could dig into a little bit of some of that evidence and that myth of the trickle-down theory. Um, I grew up in the States and I remember Ronald Reagan, <laughs> even as a child, uh, proffering this, this theory as the thing that would drive our economy. Um, and certainly, you know, 30 years later, it's been proven untrue. Why is that? Why, is it, why doesn't it work? Um, like, I, I think it's because business, the, the way they work, they will now, it's like one of their priorities making profits, but also uh, giving dividends to their shareholders. So um, investing is not necessarily the, the good way to, to go for them. So they will not necessarily invest or in their workforce or either in like other um, product that, that they need. So it's just like, why it doesn't work on my end, the, the way that it's just the data that I've seen and the data is not presented um, by a ton of economists. It took, I, I think, Piketty, Soupman, uh, Stiglitz and like really strong economists with, with character that were ready to, to challenge the status quo and, and say, hey, guys, it doesn't work. Like, look at the data. The evidence is here. Um, and so, so, so yeah, like we, Angela mentioned it a, a little bit, uh, the, like the evidence show that they are not investing, that most of the time they, they, they keep the money and they, they don't invest. So therefore no job, no more job is created and no more money in, into the pockets of, of regular folks or workers. Uh, so we, we need to change the approach. 
Um, and one last thing I, I want to say is that those company, sometimes we say, let's give them more bucks so they can invest, but they already benefits a lot. Like we are educating their workforce. We have infrastructure for them that they can use and that they don't necessarily have to pay. And on top of that, we're, we're going to cut their, their cor corporate tax. It's like, it's just insane the amount of money that we're giving to them for them to not reinvest after. And you have in the book, I know uh, you have this great chart um, that shows, in fact, the amount of corporate assets that are stored in intellectual property, uh, I think in um, equipment um, and, you know, sort of uh, productive economic means and uh, the amount stored in cash. Um, Angela, what's been happening to that trend? Are they just storing, hoarding money? It seems yeah. like just went straight up over the last 15 years or so. Yeah, it really has. And um, Mark Kearney, uh, the former governor of the Bank of Canada and governor of the Bank of Im England and potential uh, prime ministerial candidate at some point, um, he said uh, that it was dead money. And he got a lot of pushback. But if you look at it, even since he made that pronouncement, it's, it's even accelerated. And I think there's some really simple explanation for it. So corporate taxes are a pure tax on profit. It's not the way that individuals pay taxes where you pay tax on your income um, and you have a certain bit that you don't have to pay tax on, right? The first amount, but then it doesn't really matter how much your house costs or how much food costs, you, you still have to pay the same amount of income tax. Whereas a corporation um, they, they subtract the cost of labor and they subtract the cost of their investments from the tax that they have to pay. So if they're thinking about where to make an investment, um, a higher corporate tax rate actually incentivizes more productive investment. Um, and so the whole idea of the trickle down has it backwards. And this is what the data shows us is that if, if you have a high corporate tax rate and then you have um, cutouts for uh, investing in machinery or investing in labor, then that's how you incentivize productive investment. And uh, and so then the companies that don't do that, the, they may decide, oh, well, it's not worth us to do that. We'll pay the, the higher corporate tax rate. Um, and, and But if they don't have that incentive, they may as well keep the cash on hand so they can do share buybacks if they have to, to uh, raise the price. Um, and one of the reasons that they might do that is because the people making the decisions, the executives, all have a vested interest in making the share prices higher or the um, dividends higher, right? They don't necessarily care about the long-term health of the company. They don't necessarily care whether the workers are happy or productive or, or anything like that. They want their bonus for the share <laughs> because those bonuses can be a lot of money. Um, and so they make decisions that maximize their bonuses, which are not uh, the same as the decisions that are good for the whole economy or even the long-term health of that company. So I think it's, when you think about it, it's pretty straightforward about why they hold it in cash and why they do shareholder buybacks and why they make those decisions that they do. And so we need to, we need to make rules so that they can't, someone in the comments just mentioned Nortel, but think about Sears, the executives at Sears bled that pension dry fully legally yeah. and then and when they folded and went bankrupt there was no pension left for the workers and so our rules are set up in a way that allows them to do this and they should not be allowed to do this yeah i i, I have a lot of questions in the chat about how we why it is that our political decision makers have made these decisions over this last period of time and how we switch that motivation. And I, I promise uh, those who've asked those questions, I'm going to get there. I want to dig a little bit in into the mechanics of the wealth tax that you propose in the book. So we also have some questions about that. Um, from Michael Vickers, we have the question of what are some examples of measures around the world um, that are being taken right now or are already in place or are being seriously considered? And we know that there are some places that have had a wealth tax successfully for a while and other places that have just either instituted one or are in the, in the midst of serious considerations, such as the UK. 
Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Why don't we start with you, Angela, and then we'll move to Joe. Sure. So um, Canada, I think, is the only OECD country that doesn't have an inheritance tax or a wealth tax. Lots of countries have some kind of tax on wealth. Um, but uh, there are some really successful examples in, in Europe. Um, there's some really unsuccessful examples that I think we can learn from as well. France, for example, uh, had a lot of exclusions in their uh, tax, which made it seem like it wasn't fair. They had it set at a low level. It didn't, you didn't tax art, but you did tax homes. And so it was, it was widely seen as ineffective, difficult to administer and, and unfair. And so it got rolled back. Other countries like Switzerland have had a much more successful um, experience with, with wealth taxes. And you find that actually rich people will stay in Switzerland. They like living in Switzerland. They like the things that their taxes can buy them. And so they've struck a nice balance, a good deal that everyone's okay with. Uh, we've seen throughout the pandemic, there's several countries, uh, I think it's Argentina, Jonathan, that is yeah. proposing or has proposed a wealth tax in terms of helping to pay for the recovery. Um, Bolivia has proposed one. And so it's definitely, it's coming up more and more. Um, Elizabeth Warren in the United States has been like for a long time an advocate of a wealth tax. So it is, it is a popular idea that's, that's growing more popular during the pandemic because we have seen so many wealthy um, individuals and corporations just become more and more wealthy. And so that disparity is getting really stark. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting to see countries like Argentina um, suddenly bring in a kind of emergency wealth tax in order to deal with some of the costs of COVID in order to fund some of the economic stimulus they need uh, in order to restart um, their economy and recover from the pandemic. Um, and certainly, you know, the UK's consideration of, a, I think, they, a five-year period of a wealth tax of about on anyone, I think it's a quarter of a million of wealth too. So it's actually quite a little bar, which is interesting too. There's lots of different variations, it seems, where you have Elizabeth Warren's, uh, you know, 2% tax on uh, anything over 50 million versus uh, taxes of a smaller amount on a lesser amount. Um, what kind of tax do you, what kind of wealth tax are you uh, considering for Canada, recommending for Canada, given our particular circumstances here? Um, in the book, we, we talk about the NDP proposal of, of 2019 because that was pretty much the first time that it was proposed by a political party uh, in Canada. Like we, there has been some chatter in the 2000 about an inheritance tax, which is completely different than, than a wealth tax. Um, and the proposal was a 20, like over 20 million, you will pay one person tax, um, which is, I would say, like compared to other proposal is is a, it's more kind of a common sense. Um, I feel that after the pandemic and seeing the the billionaires and the super wealthy making seventy eight billions, we might be at a at a moment where uh, like political party could go beyond that because like there's a need to to fix and we need to act quite quickly. Um, so so yeah, that was the idea of. Uh, a wealth tax for wealth over 20 million, so you will pay uh, 1%. So for each dollar of wealth over 20 million, you will pay 1%. And for certain people, like that amount of money is is ridiculously small and it doesn't make an impact on, on them at all when we could use that to make an impact on other inv individuals that really need help. Yeah, and one of the reasons in the book that we say we support a wealth tax over an inheritance tax is oftentimes um, it's easier to do tax planning for inheritance taxes. Um, I know my great grandmother was not super wealthy, but she had this planned out where she was giving each of her kids a certain amount of money before she died so that there wouldn't be any money in the bank for probate kind of thing. And so a lot of people do this even now to reduce the amount of probate that they might have to pay on an estate. Um, so I don't know if people know this, but like when you, when you die, there is a certain amount, you have to pay a percentage of the value of the estate to the provincial government. Um, but it's, it's quite small and it's pretty easy to avoid. Um, and so I, I think that's, that's one of the key reasons. But the other reason 
is we talk about this in the book and it's actually really relevant to right now. Um, if you think about the intergenerational impacts of hoarding wealth, of being able to accumulate wealth, allowing it to accumulate over a person's lifetime can actually, um, without any intervention, that that's detrimental to our economy. What we want to be able to do is, is actually restructure the economy a little bit so that, um, and if we think about um, the ways that we have prevented Indigenous communities, for example, from accumulating wealth, the way that we've stolen wealth from those communities and what that intergenerational impact is. Um, and Miles Korak, who's a Canadian and American economist that, that deals with income inequality, he talks about it as the Great Gatsby Curve and how much we transmit inequality to the next generation. And so it's not just on income inequality, it's on wealth inequality. And so we need to think about the ways that allowing some people to hoard wealth over their whole life actually takes that wealth out of the common good and how some people are prevented from building wealth in their communities. And so uh, I, I, I think that an annual wealth tax addresses that to some extent where we're saying, actually we don't, and, and certainly there are proposals that go much farther <laughs> than we do. There's like, you, you get a billion dollars if you've got a billion dollars, you won. I get everything else, right? Over a billion dollars because this is ridiculous. No person needs a billion dollars. Um, and, and so I think that's great. <laughs> but what we're proposing is something that we think would actually get passed. And we think you could be a little bit stronger now. Maybe you lower the bar to 10 million. Maybe you increase the percentage to, to 2%. Um, that's all kind of in the range of what we've, we've proposed. Uh, and, I, and I think it's workable and I think it, it attacks that principle of saying every year you're accumulating wealth on the we more wealth on the wealth you already have um, and that's bad for the economy. <laughs> and I'll just add to that like to the percentage is like if you at some point if you go too high in terms of the percentage like it can start to really make sense to move out of the country. Um, if you keep it low uh, like it will cost you more to move for a wealthy person than to stay. And that's, that's why, like, I think the, the NDP proposal has, has been built that way is that like when you, you stay into the 1%, 2%, like it, it, evidence show that like super wealthy will not have the, the advantage or the incentive to, to move out. They will just have to pay the tax. Um, so, so, so yeah, that's, that's there's some proposal that that goes higher but sometime when they are doing this and that they go to four or five percent it's because it's a temporary tax it's a one year um so so yeah just for for those that are listening just keep that in mind when when you're uh reading about wealth tax. i have a lot of uh, a lot of questions in the in the chat about you know money laundering through tax havens uh you know the the fact that corporations and certain wealthy individuals are placing their money offshore in order to avoid taxes already. Um, and I'm going to handle this in, the, in just a second as a, as a package. Before that, though, while we're still on wealth tax, um, I want to get both of you to comment on the connection between wealth tax and fighting what we kind of consider the two crises we had before the pandemic came, which was you know, racial and economic inequality and climate change. Now, oftentimes, wealth tax is tied as a potential solution to these things, and maybe you could unpack for us a little bit why that's tied as a solution and why that's seen as a solution. Joe, yeah, do you want to go? Sure. So, um, in terms of, so Extendicare is a long-term care company. During the uh, pandemic, when thousands of people were dying in long-term care homes, uh, they actually increased their profit margin. They paid less than the statutory rate of uh, income tax, and they paid out money to their uh, shareholders, and, and there were bonuses paid to their executives. And uh, I think most Canadians think that's pretty outrageous. Uh, so if we had an economic system, and now it's not just a wealth tax, but if those, if those dividends that were being uh, paid out 
were taxed appropriately, it would no longer make sense to pay out those dividends. It would have actually made more sense to increase the wages to the mostly racialized, low-income women who were working on the front lines of the pandemic. Or maybe it would have made sense for them to buy masks, rubber N95 masks for those workers, right? Or, or to, to somehow, like, it's not just the wealth tax there, it's the whole system. Um, but the wealth tax is a, is a part of that. And if you're talking about the ways that we build wealth in our communities, one of those ways is through public services, is through the provision of universal services. And so if we have public childcare, if we have public long-term care, then um, that gives communities, um, it makes life more affordable and it, it allows them to, to build wealth. And if you are paying the workers in those jobs that are very, um, very uh, gender segregated, very racialized jobs, and so they're discriminated against, and so they don't get the, the fair wages that we want them um, to be getting, then you have to give them more bargaining power. So I'm not answering your question. This is not about a wealth tax. <laughs> I'm saying that it's a bunch of the other pieces that build the bargaining power. But one thing a wealth tax does is uh, a reduce the bargaining power of the wealthiest uh, hopefully provide an incentive for them to make better choices with their money because they're like oh, i'm just going to give it in the wealth tax anyway like maybe i should make more better decisions with it and uh, it gives the public purse some resources to be able to invest in the things that we all benefit from yeah that's great um jonathan maybe you can talk a little bit about the connection with climate change yeah but, but. Um, yeah, like like Oxfam has done like a couple of reports throughout the years, and they have shown that like the people that are um, emitting the most are the wealthiest. Um, they are so when we go and we ask the wealthiest to pay their fair share, we reduce the like yeah we reduce the amount of emission that they that they produce, but like also a wealth tax like angela was explaining it will also give more revenues to to the government to invest in things like fighting against climate change because we we need to remember that all the decision that has been made since the 90s to reduce the amount of money that the wealthy the wealthy pay like we are it's 50 billion a year of less so it's a significant amount of money that we can redistribute and that's why the, the book is called share the wealth it's because the government has the power and the potential to share the wealth where it's needed so to go to the other point that you have mentioned for uh, racial inequality or even economic inequality the government will take a decision that the money should go where people need it the most or where our society need needed the most and right now the money should go to fight the climate crisis because that's the second big like after the pandemic that that crisis has not gone away yeah and I, I think the what you've both spoken to is that intersection of wealth and power right yeah. uh, in both of those circumstances wealth and power and and who gets oh. to decide what is a good workplace and what wealth is shared with workers I mean, what wealth and power does when it comes to our big global issues around climate change. Um, you know, one of the, there's a, a theme in the chat right now talking about, uh, you know, tax avoidance, tax havens, uh, a concern that tax havens have grown and why we can't just shut them down, um, why we've lost this 50 billion um, and why we can't stop that loss and go back to a time when tax havens weren't so popular and weren't so used, and we didn't have such a huge problem, it seems, with, with tax avoidance. Can we talk about that a little bit? Uh, Angela, you want to start us off? Sure. So Canada um, has really bad legislation on this, and we have a really bad history of actually having elites from Canada, bankers, politicians, whoever, working with tax haven countries in order to set up regulatory regimes that would help rich Canadians avoid paying tax in Canada. So we're definitely part of the global problem in terms of tax havens. And, um, 
and the UK is as well. So the the tax havens that you've heard of probably include the Isle of Man and the Jersey and Guernsey. But the UK laws are getting a little bit better on transparency. Canada's laws are are it's really hard to know who's the beneficial owner of a company. Um, it's legal, like Loblaw set up a bank in a country um, and basically funneled money through it. And that was legal. Uh, so the Canada tried to take them to court and say it was illegal, but we didn't have the right legislation in place to say they couldn't avoid money t taxes that way. So we lost. Um, and I think that's being challenged again, like we're trying, um, but um, Murray Rankin, uh, NDP MP in 2017 proposed a bill that's really simple, a change that's really simple in terms of uh, this profit shifting problem, saying that if um, you, ha you have to have economic substance for the money to go to that other country, because what we have now, so Rivera, there was a big uh, report that came out about Rivera, which is a publicly owned long-term care corporation. and. Rivera does a lot of work with uh, UK corporations. And it turns out that a lot of the directors of these corporations have personal business uh, businesses in tax havens. And they, they work somehow through real estate investment trusts. A lot of the profits basically go to these, these private corporations that the directors own in these tax havens. And so they don't pay tax. And it's really hard for us to um, to, to track, trace it and track it down because we don't have the, the, the financial transparency legislation that we should have. So there's those two pieces. There's the economic substance. Um, and then there's the, the fiscal transparency. The, the, we don't have in the United States, they have like a national organization that looks at this and, and does all of these rules. We have different rules in each of the provinces and, um, and we don't have a, a really good database and it's expensive to try to figure this stuff out. So uh, that I think are two reasons. And obviously I, I think it's because of corporate capture in Canada. We have right now at the Competition Bureau, they have approved a merger of two telecommunications companies, right? The CRTC, the head of the CRTC right now is a, um, a former executive from a telephone company who has made a decision that benefits that company, right? So we have these ties, we have these relationships, and we don't have a lot of uh, transparency. And again, that's one of the reasons we wanted to write the book to get some of the information out there uh, in terms of the pharmaceutical industry. The lobbying that we get, the intense political lobbying um, that uh, pharmaceutical companies spend in order to make sure that we don't get pharmacare. So there's, there's a huge amount of political pressure from the wealthiest in Canada and the people who benefit from the status quo that uh, we don't see. I think most of us, um, we don't see. And the politicians are, are beholden to, to them. They hear from them the most, first of all, so they are convinced by their story to some extent. And, um, but then they also benefit from being friends with the, those rich people. So yeah, it's power and, and influence and, and all of those Things that I don't think are surprising to anyone, but it's um, we don't have a lot of proof again because we don't have the transparency mm -hmm. in place. Yeah, yeah, you're probably reading through the questions in the chat as well about you know why why are legislators legislators so seemingly cowardly on this issue? Uh, do they stand to benefit? That is that what's happening, and how can we stop them from benefiting from it? Right now, we have you know close to 80% of Canadians supporting measures like a wealth tax, uh, like an excess corporate profit tax um, in Canada, and yet we saw so like basically no action on this in the federal budget uh, that was tabled a month ago. Um, Jonathan, what you know you're right close to what's happening. Um, at a decision-making level, what are you seeing in terms of uh, what's riding up against this great public support for these measures when it comes to decisions made in Parliament? Like, uh, Angela touched touch it a, a little bit, but like, obviously, the, the lobbying activity is like, it's, it's just insane. And especially for the government, when you look to the numbers, like sometimes uh, a, a member of the government can be lobbied like a liberal member can be lobbied once a day per or be 
take pharmaceutical and that's that's just an example but that's same that's the same thing for the oil industry as an example or the telecom or the banks so the the more powerful have money to hire the best lobbyists and i have nothing about against lobbyists because they're quite good at their job but at the end of the day at the end of the day the better the best one are hired not by not by organization or like a social organization or NGOs, the best lobbyists are hired by the most powerful and the one that have the money to, to do it. Um, so there's that. There's also the fact that I think mainstream media and also economists for a really long time have believed in the myth that we have talked about in, in the book that throughout the time we have seen that it's not true, it doesn't work, but there's a lot of, of money, uh, not money, a lot of people that continue to to embolden those those myths. And so it's hard to de deconstruct. So when a government wants to, to do something, they know what is coming. If they, they want to go after the elite and the powerful, sometimes it's their friends, but some other times it's just like, that they know that the pressure will come and that a lot of money will be invested in campaigns. Um, like we have seen this with Pharmacare and I, I brought Ben has done a, an amazing job on, on, that, on that issue. It's, it's so important. Universal Pharmacare is really critical for, for Canadians. Um, but we see the insurance company and big phar pharmaceutical company putting a lot of money and ads on social media trying to make Canadians believe that they will pay the price, the price of, of that change and that ultimately they won't benefit of this. So we know that when we, we need to change the system, um, that they have a lot of, of, um, of tools and uh, to like try to stop us. And so that's, that's why if I go back to the introduction that I've made, that's why we will need the number in people like that's why we will need a, a movement if we really want to change things and what make things harder is that for everyday canadian like things are tough and things are tougher and tougher and sometimes they need to have two or three jobs so don't ask them to get involved don't ask them to care about politics because politics is not there for them except for some politicians and maybe some political parties so it's really tough for them to even consider to get engaged um, because they don't make ends meet so like it's kind of a vicious circle of politicians just hearing to a small group or the revolving door and and the society not being able to evolve or just considering where to to go because we or struggling to to make ends meet. Yeah, there's a real hunger in the chat right now um, for a transformational approach to this, um, considering the concerns we have. You know, it's taken us so long to create the problem of climate change. If we really want to beat it, don't we have to be really quite bold and aggressive? Others talking about uh, eradicating inheritance and inheritance cap. Um, how bold? can we get and how do we get that bold how do we get gain support to get that bold if we're uh, you know facing this crossroads right now in canada post pandemic uh, with you know a, a, a inequality crisis that's just gotten way worse and staring down um, climate disaster um, how bold should we be getting and how bold can we get with these political realities to you I That's love that it. question. Okay, um, go ahead. I think there's a huge appetite out there for boldness. I think people sometimes didn't believe what politicians told them because they felt like it was tinkering around the edges. They're like, yeah, but will that really change the whole system? Like if you close this one loophole, aren't the corporations just going to find another loophole in order to, to avoid the taxes? So I think that if you, this is actually why we structured the book the way that we did. We started off talking about kind of what we saw, the extremity of the problem. Then we talked about the myths that have been used to justify that problem. And I think one of the, the things is, is, you know, Margaret Thatcher said there is no alternative. So people knew the system sucked for them, but they 
they thought it was necessary. They thought that if we did anything differently, corporations would leave um, and we wouldn't have any any economy. And you you get comparisons to, you know, North Korea or um, Cold War Russia. And they say, you know, we'll be in bread lines, which is obviously not true. That's not the situation that we're in, but it's pretty compelling. People are like, oh, there's, you know, I'm doing okay. The uncertainty of the change is, is um, enough that to prevent me from really pushing for it. But now I think there's a huge appetite. People have seen what the failure to invest in ourselves has meant and and that we can do it differently, that there is an alternative and we can work together. We can have more economic democracy. We can have more credit unions. We can have more co-ops. We can have more um, worker driven ideas, right? And, and community driven ideas that more of that ownership at the local level, I think is gonna be really important. Um, but we, we can also raise a lot of money at the federal level. Like the extent, it boggles my mind how much we've cut taxes since the 90s. It's 50 to $75 billion a year. That would fund pharmacare, childcare, and a climate transition. That's enough money to do the things that we need to do. And I'm not saying that we can't borrow money. We can. We can borrow money to fund, the, fund climate change because the benefit of that will outweigh the cost of borrowing. I'm just saying it's a lot of resources that right now are going into buying people really fancy yachts and expensive cabins and, and houses that isn't going to helping people with disabilities, that isn't going to uh, post-secondary education, stuff that's going to enhance people's well-being and, and foster an economy that we want in the future. And so the way that we've started, then we show you how we can raise that money. That's what we do in the book. And then we say what we can do with it and how we can change it. And Broadbent has a really great report that you did as part of the Essential Solutions Project, where you talk about how making school affordable, how that actually has an anti-racist element to it. You're helping to lower the barriers to future economic success. Um, and that if we really wanted to do something transformative, there's reparations and, and wealth returning land back for First Nations uh, communities. That type of wealth restoration to communities that um, we have uh, underfunded for so long would really be transformative. And I, I think there's an appetite for it. I might be like completely delusional, but I, I, I talk to my family who are not normally the lefty that I am and, and they are with me on this. So. That's, that's also, that's one of my indications. When I talk to my friends or family members who usually are not on side with me on most of my politics, yeah. um, find their hunger for this sort of values driven um, mass yeah. change in the way we treat wealth and the way we treat, uh, we treat profit and who, and who gets a share of that. I, I really find myself quite surprised. Yeah. And, and, you know, and greatly inspired by it too. Joe, what are, what's your sense of what's what's pragmatic, what's practical, what what kind of change uh, can we get, and how can we get there? Yeah, I think I think we need to be inspiring and but believable. I think that's a, a lot of the time. That's the question that I get when I'm talking to either my friends or in other places. Is that like people want to know what's the solution, but they also want to make sure that it's not just a dream and that it can actually get done. And that's essentially also why I wanted to write that book with, with Angela is, is because like we also show that it can be done and that it's not just like fantasy um, or unicorn unicorn world. Um, so so yeah, but I, I think polling after polling and Robin has done a really good job on that front too is like it shows, like there's appetite for, for, like taxing the super wealthy and going after the, the different loopholes. Um, so now I think it's just getting people excited and not just in in the polls, but maybe getting them to vote or getting engaged in a in a different way. 
Uh, people are talking in the chat about different constructive and disruptive ways of engaging in order to build power around these ideas. Um, you know, we've, I think we've talked about some of the constructive ways about trying to, uh, trying to base um, power and wealth in communities, um, to find ways to share it more publicly, whether it be through co-ops, whether it be through things like community benefit agreements and other ways that we can do that beyond the wealth tax aspect of it. Um, but what are the, some of the, dis, do, do either of you feel comfortable talking about some of the more disruptive ways uh, that we go about uh, building the momentum towards these sorts of measures, particularly towards the wealth tax, in ways that will convince, convince our politicians to actually act on this and to stand up, frankly, to the lobbyists that seem to have their ear. Angela, you want to take a crack at it? I mean, politicians are going to need to know that their job's on the line if they don't do it. If the liberals propose a token tax on airplanes and, and yachts and mostly they're not hearing from people that it's it's an election issue people might say yeah i support a wealth tax but is it a ballot issue are you gonna are you gonna vote this way um or are you kind of still gonna float around so there's lots of there's lots of um constructive ways you can do a day of action you could do um i saw somebody in the chat a general strike i think a general strike if you were going to do something like that, that takes months of preparation to do the mobilization and the organizing that you would need for it to be effective. Um, but you need to, politicians need to know their jobs on the line and then they start to take it more seriously. So um, call your MP, <laughs> write them a letter, organize um, protests outside their office. Like these are things that you can do and just like harass them. Yeah, like not, harass, harass, but like call once a week, right? Keep asking, keep bringing it up, keep, you know, I had a friend who lived in Pierre Polyev's riding and she organized a monthly meeting with him to talk about things that were important to her on the left. And and he, will, he would take that meeting and have to listen to her. So yes, definitely call your MPs, um, get involved with a local group to help build that local action. So in the book, Jonathan and I talk about worker organizations like Fight for 15, uh, your union, your um, church maybe is, in, is involved or your mosque is involved in doing something in the community and building that kind of awareness and those connections. Um, so yeah, there's lots of different ways that you can get involved. Um, and uh, I mean, we, we did see before COVID, we saw it getting pretty extreme where people were shutting down rail lines and people were sitting on the tracks and saying no you have got to listen to us now we are gonna you know throw ourselves on the gears and and you're not getting away with avoiding this discussion so i think once COVID is over i i would expect to see that type of engagement continue and we're seeing we're seeing some of it already someone brought up the tax loophole that REITs have right now and that are mm. by a lot of the very large REITs that also happen to be some of the biggest slum landlords uh, in Canada and acorn in fact um, has a campaign right now on rain in the REITs uh, to look to close that loophole and then use that tax revenue gained through closing that loophole specifically to fund repairs and to fund affordable housing um, so there are lots of really great campaigns that people can engage in um, to take on, you know, a specific tax issue like a tax loophole on REITs or a tax loophole on capital gains. I mean, there's a, quite a few tax loopholes to take on there, um, but also to take on the larger, some of the larger, uh, more values driven argument around just needing to tax the ultra rich um, so much more. Um, and I would be, you know, remiss if I didn't plug the tax the rich campaign. Um, which the Broadband Institute is part of with QP National and uh, United Steelworkers and ACORN and Lead Now and Canadians for Tax Fairness and Greenpeace and Oxfam um, and, uh, and a, a couple others as well. Um, it's a really great campaign and we're really trying to build a movement to, to leverage this kind of power for transformational change. So I hope that all of our participants are signed into that campaign. We try to give regular updates about different actions that are happening all over Canada and also different actions that are happening across the world so that we can be inspired by those actions. 
Um, I'd like to, I'd like to, you know, I, I, we've gotten so many questions and what's amazing about uh, uh, ask me anything like this is that so many of the questions have been answered in the chat by other participants. I don't know if you've noticed this, but there's been an ongoing discussion in the chat. Uh, that I've barely been able to scratch. I can't wait to read it over later. Um, but I want to find, you know, I, I want to find a, some conclusion to this in a way that's most inspiring for everyone um, to think about what we could have if we actually did a wealth tax and came back to the tax levels, someone mentioned in the chat, what happened if we came back to the tax levels we had in the 1980s? Um, if we came back to those tax levels and put in a wealth tax, what kind of revenue would we have to be able to fund the things we want and how would we see the power shift in Canada? Uh, Joe, let's go to you on that one to start. Okay. Yeah, and I just want to go back to you, uh, your point about the work that Broadband is doing with like other organizations. I think the Angela really answer well what what we need uh, to to make things change. Uh, but the fact that Broadband and many other organizations kind of put the work and together, it's it's different because like the movement is bigger, and sometimes we there's an organization or a union uh, doing something that is similar to the other, but the fact that we're not necessarily together, the pressure is, is less strong. So um, I just wanted to, to say good job to Broadband to bring all those great organizations together. And I hope that other will join uh, later. Um, and yes, I, I think your, your question is, is amazing. I, we have tried to, to answer that a little bit at, at the end, but like the amount of money we're talking, I, I don't recall perfectly the, the, the total amount, but like we're talking about many, many billions of dollars a year. So the, Angela talked about uh, having universal pharmacare, uh, dental care is also something that uh, I'm hearing quite a lot from, from people that, and we could support people to, to get dental care. And those type of policy are helping people that need it the most. And when it's universal, it just help everybody. Um, I know that childcare is, might be coming, but it's also a, a great investment. And on, on my side, uh, I might be biased a bit, but like it, it has been promised for um, a, a large number of years. So I hope that this time we're, we're seeing it, but like we, we could just see a society that is just more just and that is more fair um, a, a smaller feeling that the system is rigged. And I, I talk about it a little bit at the beginning, but like the type of polarization that we're seeing in, a, in our society and the anger, and sometimes the anger is from a neighbor to another neighbor or somebody calling out an immigrant and hateful comments. It's, it's because people, like a lot of people are just anxious about the life that they are, that that they have and they don't see solution and instead of targeting the the government who are making not good decision and they are just channeling out the the feeling that the system is rigged and that the system is rigged against us and that it's in favor of the elite and, and powerful so i think if we're building an economy that is more just and i think sharing the wealth goes with better public services like pharmacare like dental care, child care, and, and other uh, that we're mentioning in the book. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the hope that we have, yeah. uh, is that this is, this is the kind of thing we can get. But there's certainly a lot of fear as deficits go up that, that, that the cost of the spending will fall onto the people who can afford at least, which I think is another part of this, um, is saying, no, no. We can we can afford this, and it's the people who can afford it most that are going to pay for it, as opposed to those who have seen their wages be stagnant over the last uh, over the last two decades and have seen their cost of living go up. Um, Angela, can you wrap us up with a last inspiring word about what we can achieve if we actually do institute this kind of bold tax reform? Yeah, I really like. Katrina, how you've been talking about it in terms of imagining what's possible. I think that um, we need to think about the economy differently. We've bought into this idea that the economy is the private sector. And I mentioned in the book that um, there's actually an iconic uh, 
economist. She's a um, very interesting lady, but she has a good metaphor. Helen uh, Henderson has a good metaphor for the economy of a cake. And so if we think about the private sector at the top of the cake, it's supported by the public sector. Under that, it's supported by households. So the unpaid work that people do in households. And then under that, it's supported by the environment. And so if we have this more um, accurate representation of the economy, if we think about our society, our environment, all of this being part of the same thing, and how do we make that whole thing work well? What could we build out of this together instead of what we've had for the past 40 years, which is the top has been sucking resources out of the bottom layers, right? We've been sucking resources out of the environment. We've been sucking resources out of unpaid labor. And, and those bills are coming due. Those, those gaps that we have um, been trying to ignore in how we measure GDP or how we measure growth or welfare, we haven't been measuring that, but that, that doesn't mean it hasn't been happening and that we're not paying the consequences of having ignored the costs of that. So if we think about the economy differently and we make different choices with this better understanding of the economy and we build power and we elect good representatives, I'm running for the, uh, I'm running for the NDP nomination in Ottawa Center. So just a little plug for me. So if you elect me, um, then maybe we can get some change happening. Maybe we can make some of these concrete differences. Um, we can build that broader understanding that it's possible to have a better economy. It's possible to have a better society. And um, it's not inevitable that the people at the top hold all the power. Uh, it's a perfect, perfect ending to our evening. We could sit and talk about this for another hour. And we have the questions to, to fuel us along, but um, we, add, we are at our hour. So I would like to um, close us there, remind people um, that you can get the book. We've put the links to the book in the chat, Share the Wealth, How We Can Tax Canada is Super Rich and Create a Better Country for Everyone. It's a shift. There we go. It's a beautiful cover. Uh, <laughs> It's a shift of money, but it's also a shift of power, and it is a change to an economy um, that includes everyone, as opposed to just some. Um, so it really is an important aspect of the kind of transformation we're looking for in this world. And also go to letstaxtherich.ca if you want to link in to the campaign we talked about on taxing the rich in Canada. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you for the lovely, lively chat. And of course, Joe and Angela, thank you for your brilliant answers to these questions. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Katrina. Thanks, Katrina.